Good morning, everybody. It's an extraordinary morning already. This, hap- this has nothing to do with my message this morning, but I got to say to James, brother, keep doing Amen. what you're doing. Jennifer, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, Sorry, that was personal. A couple years ago, I went to a conference called Catalyst, and I want to purposefully slow down for a moment and tell you that I need you to be present. What I mean by be present is some of y'all are not paying attention. You're not here yet. Your mind is elsewhere. I mean, you're sitting in the room. But by the power of God, I want to ask you to be present. Because I think God is showing up. And the last thing that you want is for God to show up and you missed him. Be present. Just pay attention. Maybe, Maybe turn the smartphone off just a moment. The Facebook status can wait. Because it doesn't make sense for us to talk about personal spiritual revival and God present this opportunity for you and you miss it because you weren't present. Be present. Would you just slow down for a moment? Just pay attention. Pastor Joel will spend time preparing a message, and he will present that message, and sometimes we're not paying attention. We need to be present. This morning, we sang the gospel of Jesus Christ in those songs. And I have not boohooed as much as I have in the last couple of Sundays sitting in this audience. Because you need to know, as a worship pastor and a worship leader, it's a unique thing for me to sit in the audience and be led. And I recognize, as Americans, we have the right to edit in real time. But I'm going to ask if you allow me to lead you this morning. Because this is an opportunity unique in the history of humanity. This moment, this time is unique. Would you be present? All right, let's get dangerous. (laughs) I hate spam. (laughs) I think cauliflower is disgusting. (laughs) And one of the biggest culinary lies of all time is beef liver tastes good. (laughs) Now, I recognize that I need to eat. I have to eat because if I don't eat, my body will wither away and die. But the good news is I don't have to eat this stuff. (laughs) Because I live in this country at this time, and there's plenty of food. Do you know we actually have something called junk food? We have so much food around us that we can consume junk. That's how much food we have. When a baby is born, a brand new baby, I mean the moment that the baby is born, there are certain things that that child needs immediately. It needs security. 
After all, it's had a pretty good deal for nine months, you know, rent-free and all of that. (laughs) And it needs to feel comfortable because now all of a sudden it's bright and it's cold and what's going on? I don't know any of these people. I need security. That child needs warmth and rest. So somebody will grab a blanket, cute little hat, Put it on the baby, hand the baby to their mom, and very soon you will hear the magic sound of because they're hungry and they need food and they need to eat. And it won't take long before this child will let you know, I need you to feed me. You know, without spiritual food, we, we're in the same situation. But, you know, spiritually, we have and love and desire security. We want that deposit of the Holy Spirit in us so that we know that we are his. We desire warmth and rest in the Savior's love. But for some reason, we think that we can live just with security and warmth, and we don't have to eat food. How ludicrous. Because just like in the physical, if you don't eat, eventually you will wither and die. Spiritually, you will eventually wither and die. This is a fact. But we already know this. This is not news. We know that once we get in Christ, we need to eat. We need to have spiritual milk. We need to have spiritual meat. We need to be eating from the word of God. We know this. And yet we're not eating. Why not? One of the things that I learned in studying how to preach is when you take the word of God and you begin to look at the different passages of scripture, you take the words and the punctuation and the way uh, that they are presented in the sentence, you look at the vocabulary, you look at the speaker who's writing, the target audience, how it lays in history, you take all of these things. One of the, the benefits of study, if you will use it, is to write questions down. And just as you read the text, questions will come up, and it might not seem like it makes a direct difference, but you just write them down anyway. So in my study, there was one question that came to mind. So I wrote it down. Is there ever a time in a human being's life, ever, when they are actually no longer hungry? Have you ever thought about that? So, it's 21st century, I went to the internet. (laughs) And I asked the question, and I found an answer. The answer is yes. There's actually a time when a human being can lose the desire, I mean the very desire to eat. Not that they don't eat, that they are no longer hungry. And it's called severe starvation. There can come a time if you go an extended period of time without eating food that you will literally lose the desire to eat. The body starts playing tricks on you. It starts shutting down physically. Your energy level plummets. And then the body and the mind, they they become in conflict with one another. And the mind develops this extreme apathy. And this person, because they've gone so long without eating, and they are in such severe starvation mode, that they could be standing in the middle of a grocery store, 
and it wouldn't phase them for one moment. As a matter of fact, they could be literally dying, and they are dying, and they don't even have the desire to eat. And when somebody is experiencing severe starvation, I have found that there are three things that that person needs in order to get well. It's amazing. They're the same three that a newborn baby needs. They need security. They need to know that it's going to be all right. They need warmth and rest. Their body is in trauma. And slowly but surely, they need liquid, and then milk, and then solid food to bring them back to life. Because in the spirit, if we go so long without eating, we will become starved. And you think that you don't hang out with God because it's an intellectual decision. I got news for you. You don't even have the desire to be with God. It's been taken away from you. What you need is a fresh start. We're talking about reignition. Let's pray. There comes a point, Father, that we simply cannot do it by ourselves. We need you, and this is that time. As we talk about a subject that we've already known about, already have experienced, will you take us to the next level beyond talking about food? Would you help us to be hungry for you? We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5. Most times that I am privileged to preach and I have passages of Scripture that I will read, I will mark those. For this morning, I'm going to take the time to look for the passages with you, all right? Why do I want to take the time? I want us to be present. All right? If you don't have a Bible and you want to use one of the blue Bibles that's in the seat pocket underneath you or behind you, Matthew 5 is on page 683. We're going to read the first six verses. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up to a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Interesting two words in the sixth verse, hunger. What is hunger? Hunger is, um, it's this deep craving. It means to be needy, to suffer want, to seek with eager desire. And the way the text is translated in the Greek, there's this tense, this notion of continuation of the hunger. It could literally be translated hungering. And then thirst, thirst. Thirst comes from a Greek word that means figuratively this painful feeling of want. Eagerly longing for Usually those things by which the soul is refreshed, supported, strengthened. And it has the same 
grammatical tense of continuation. It's not just thirst. It's a continuing thirst. And so the passage could be literally translated in English, blessed are those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for they will be filled. Notice the kind of folk that were following Jesus in the earlier chapter, chapter 4 of Matthew, beginning at verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those who suffered a severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. If you were here the message last Sunday, the kind of folk that followed Jesus around, they were broken people. They were the broken. And you might have come to the same conclusion last week that I came to, and that is, we are broken. Let me just make that closer to home. I am broken. I stand on this stage broken in need of healing. It was the broken people that would follow Jesus, that would want to be around him. Why would anyone want to be around somebody that's got the power to heal when they think they're all good? The broken don't believe that they're all good because they're broken. This is the kind of folk that follow Jesus. They are the ones that were hungry. They were the ones that were thirsty. They were the ones that wanted more. You hear what I'm saying? They wanted more. So what is the word of God? When we talk about the word of God, and we use that phrase, the word of God. But what exactly is the word of God? I want to show you two things. First of all, there is the written word, the written word of God. Psalm chapter 1. Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1. If you're using the Blue Bible, it's page 383. My dad taught me that when you ask people to read God's word with you, you wait until you stop hearing the pages turn. We're in this together. Psalm chapter 1. The first two verses. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He meditates day and night on the law of the Lord, that that is written in his word. My brother and friend, Tim Riley, reminded me that usually when you talk about meditation, it's all about freeing the mind. When God talks about meditation, he wants to fill your mind. Meditate. Thank you for that. Day and night. There are times that you will need him in the day. And there are times that you will need him at night and you need to have your heart filled with him. You know, I love this book. I adore it. It is something that has been placed in me since I was a kid. Hebrews chapter 4. Let me show you this. Hebrews chapter 4. This is in the New Testament now. I want to show you why 
I love this book we call the Bible. This is the written word. In the Blue Bibles is page 847, and it finishes on 848. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The word of God, this book, You need to know it is living. It's active. If you don't watch out, it'll cut you. Have any of you ever had that discussion? What the, is the difference between the soul and the spirit? The word of God knows. Because it can divide right between the two. Even your very thoughts, your very attitudes. You haven't had an attitude check until you spend time in this book. <laughs> I have many times. And boy, have I needed an attitude check. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. In the blue Bible, it is page 843. Boy, do I love the sound of those pages turning. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible tells us that when God made man, he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All scripture is God breathed. It came from God. My mom and dad taught me about this book. And they helped me to become hungry. I learned that the word Bible means books. And that this set of books is holy. It's different like none other. There are 40 writers of this Bible. 32 in the Old Testament, 8 in the New Testament. The Bible is made up of 66 books. It's divided as the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament. And in my Thursday night Bible studies that my mother taught, she taught me that the 39 books in the Old Testament are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And that same Louisiana woman taught me on Thursday nights the 27 books of the New Testament, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. But then she said, Beyond knowing about this book, you need to open this book <laughs> and begin to consume what is in this book. Because there's more than books. 
They are active and alive. This is the written word. But I need to tell you about something else about the word of God that contained in this written word is the living word of God. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Again, I recognize that we know this, some of us. It makes this sermon difficult. And I recognize that, and so Holy Spirit, teach through me this morning. John chapter 1, and the blue Bible is 750, page 750. Want to read the first verse, then the 14th verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, the Word became flesh. It is living and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John is writing to an audience that knows a little bit about philosophy. And they had this concept that all philosophy, all knowledge, all counsel, all wisdom, it flowed from this big ocean, this big river to humanity. And this big ocean was called the Lagos. John, through the inspiration, being God-breathed. He takes that same philosophy of the Lagos and he tells folk that need to wake up and to know about Christ. In the beginning was the Lagos, this great river. And this great river, the Lagos, was with God. Well, actually, my God is the Lagos. Now, check out the miracle. We call this miracle the incarnation. All it means is that heaven came to earth and the Lagos became flesh and walked among us. And we actually were able to see his glory. He looked just like the son of God. Let me break that down. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the living word of God. Do you want to know what God has to say on the matter? Listen to Jesus. He will tell you. I am so amazed at the spiritual food that God has provided for my soul over the years. I don't want to talk a lot about eating. I just want to help you to be hungry for some more. So if you don't mind, I want to share just some food morsels, let you smell what God is cooking, all right? (laughs) For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I can do Everything through him who gives me strength. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. 
Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Transformers, <laughs> robots in disguise. Come on now. <laughs> Got too many humans in the church. We need some transformers in the church. <laughs> Transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test, watch it, and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I'm just giving you some things to gnaw on and eat, all right? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift. It's a gift from God. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You cannot come up with one place as a believer in him that you will go and be all by yourself. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For all have sinned, every one of us, and fall short of the glory of God. Here's the good news. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us. Purify us. Purify us. And you don't even think that's possible. But you need to spend time with my God. Because he can purify you from all unrighteousness. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You've been looking for truth through intellectual exercises. I got news for you. Jesus is the truth. Yeah. And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and check this out and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I just want us to experience some hunger pains again. Why? Because the psalmist wrote, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. There is a startling statistic that comes from Compassion 
International. Every five seconds, one child dies. And they die from a hunger related cause. Think about that. Every five seconds, a child somewhere in this world will die. And you think that you are so strong and tough that you can live right now on food you ate 20 years ago? My dad said in the church of Jesus Christ, we are living in a gravy train rolling on buttermilk biscuit wheels. Yeah. <laughs> Don't that sound like an okie to you? <laughs> we have a feast. But maybe it's been so long since you've eaten regularly, spiritually speaking. Right now, you're in severe starvation mode. I want to give you two ways that you can have a fresh start starting today. Here's the first thing. Increase your time in the written word of God. Increase your time in the written word of God. I want to be clear about this. I want to be very clear. If yesterday you spent no time in God's word, one second today is an improvement. I don't want to be religious about this. I don't want to be legalistic about it. But it's time for us to be hungry. Second thing, I want you to commit to daily yielding to the living word of God. Charlie, that's what I'm talking about, brother. (laughs) It's not about being perfect today. It's about yielding today. It's simple, and it's already what we know, but it seems so difficult. But the truth is, The best way to experience a fresh start is to spend more time with Jesus. The best way for a fresh start is to spend more time with Jesus. If you will, close your eyes, bow your heads, and I want to draw you to decision right now. Only for the heart that has humbled themselves like a child desires a change of heart and today wants a fresh start. Here is what I'd like for you to do. I would like for you to tell Almighty God in the quietness of your spirit that starting today, you will increase your time in the word of God. And starting today, even more so than yesterday, you will commit today and tomorrow, and God willing, every day he blesses you with, daily you will yield to Jesus. 30 seconds of silence and just decision to him.
Help us, Holy Father, to be hungering and thirsting for righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.